All right, everyone. Hey, uh, sorry we had a little uh, technical difficulties there, but uh, as you know, that's the world of the internet. Never quite when you expect it or how you expect it, but it, things still end up working out great. Uh, we're talking about sustainability here, and um, I've been lucky enough to sit down with Ruben from globalgreen.org, and their website is really uh, a focus on so many different areas. I like that you have your little icons for like the water, nuclear energy, the home, uh, solar, and then waste streams because I think those when five you play the Vanna White, so exactly. I think those five different uh, icons actually are some of the main reasons why we want to do the work that we're doing. Yep. But we're talking about policy, and you were mentioning that the policy work inside the city is thanks to you guys actually examining all this stuff, is actually able to grow and expand and at least know what the, the options are, the choices are in that space. Uh, talk a little bit about your scorecard and how you came up with it and what was the metrics that you developed. Uh, was it, did you know from the beginning kind of what that was going to look like? Well, we knew some of the big picture. Yeah. Um, I didn't go into the detail of this 18 months of research. Right. Of course, we called up City Hall and talked to the mayor's sustainability person, and we said, we'd like to see the carbon emissions report for the city. And they said, well, we've got something in 07, but it's not really comprehensive. And so then we, uh, looking at other studies from other cities, um, really developed the core areas, mm -hmm. right, of transportation and waste and electricity generation, build, sure. you know, buildings owned and operated by the city. We had to do some estimating on some of these carbon sinks. We, you know, to get good data, um, we worked really hard and we had to make some assumptions to get there. And we worked with the late Dr. Schneider, who was on our board of directors, uh, part of the Nobel laureate team of scientists with the IPCC who was at Stanford. And he said, you know, if we all wait for the data sets to be perfect, um, you know, we're all going to be drowning. So, go forward with your best uh, estimates of this information because you're trying to give prescriptive analysis of how's the city doing on trends. Mm -hmm. Are we growing in emissions or are we shrinking them? Are policies aggressive of enough or not you know, aggressive enough? So we spent a lot of time playing with, the, with just getting the numbers right and mm -hmm. then um, looking at the policies that impact that area. Sure. And, or those you know variety of areas, and some city agencies were wonderful to work with, and some, you know, it was pulling teeth to get information. Ultimately, particularly in this internet age, this should just be transparent, and cities should just have to publish it. But in the resource restrained environment that cities operate, there really is staffing issues. We several of our staffers aren't there anymore. Well, it's interesting the inefficiencies yeah. that are revealed because. If it was run more efficiently, it could actually accomplish more. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So it's, you're sort of caught in this place where they're waiting for there to be more money so they can create more efficiencies, but until they create more efficiencies, they're just going to be wasting more money. So we're caught in that little loop right now. Indeed. And the detriment is in relationship to sustainability. Sure. So from your index uh, and the way you pulled it together, you gave the city a C-, mm -hmm. right? Yep. What, what did that mean? The mayor's office and some other political folks weren't so great. It meant that it was a barely passing grade. Um, there are some things the city is doing right, and it could be doing better, certainly. Right. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot more that needs doing. And we really don't want to lay all of this on just our elected officials. The idea is that the millions of people who live in L.A. and work in L.A. are responsible collectively mm -hmm. for a megalopolis's worth of carbon emissions, a much uh, a footprint that's much larger than a city, say New York, like New York, on a per capita basis. So whether it's getting the uh, municipally owned utility to get off coal, more than 50% of our power mix comes from Utah-based coal plants. There's a lot of good rhetoric on making that happen, but we have far to go to make it a reality. Yeah. Or to putting a plan into place to uh, support and pay a fair price for distributed solar generation um, with a feed-in tariff program that would allow a place that generates sunshine 330 days or more a year to uh, take advantage of the natural environment and solar power that is wasted every day. Sure. Uh, we have a long way to go to make that a reality. And so the idea was to begin to build more of the political capital to make this a more carbon-friendly, sustainable city, have our elected leaders see how they're doing on a benchmark of over 50 
city policies that make up uh, how we're tackling climate change in this type of city. And we think that it's where the rubber hits the road. Cities are responsible for 70% of our carbon emissions. Whether or not there are federal mandates or global mandates at some point, the cities is where we're going to have to figure out how we become a more efficient, sustainable uh, place to operate. So that's the, the idea behind uh, the index, and we hope to be uh, tackling other cities like New Orleans, Chicago, New York. We're doing an innovative project in Youngstown, Ohio, the first, uh, well, not the first, but an emblematic uh, industrial city that is shrinking. And how does a city like that use a shrinking carbon footprint to become more efficient and uh, provide new services like urban ag that could be the future, some future economic uh, growth for a community like that? Definitely, definitely. All that so accurate. Yeah, having seen so many of the examples of what you're talking about uh, all around the country, it's inspiring, you know, to know that a city like Los Angeles is trying to tackle the problems. Just as I've noticed, the tiny little towns in these uh, places in Iowa or Montana or wherever I happen to have been, they really are. They're thinking about these things. They're considering it. Uh, there's usually some advocate somewhere in the city who's taking on this and really taking. That's the key, by the way, that advocate, whether it's at a city level, a company, an institution of any kind, having somebody who's going to own it and yeah. say, I'm going to make this happen, we found is invaluable. You can take all the other pieces, you know, how good is your data, how good is your analysis, how strong is your green building technical support. you got to have that advocate who's going to uh, be willing to hold people accountable and make it happen. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I always end on uh, the similar note each time I do these interviews. And uh, my, uh, my end question is usually, so what's sustainability to you? And uh, what does it mean? Well, sustainability to me, I'll start as a dad. Uh, it means creating a world um, where my kids can enjoy the wealth and bounty and beauty of the planet to a degree, at least at the level that I've been able to enjoy and hopefully to the level that my grandparents and great grandparents were able to. And thinking further out that my, you know, to the seventh generation and beyond, that my uh, son and daughters, kids and grandkids will have uh, the blessings of our planet um, to enjoy and to celebrate um, and to live longer, more healthy, productive, interconnected lives um, as opposed to the alternative, which is a really bleak consideration that, uh, that the bounty of the planet will significantly be constrained. The quality of life, the length of life, the fact that life can exist really being in the balance um, if, if we don't live that way. That's the big picture. On the real the, um, basic level, the, the wisdom that I've inherited over the years has been about, it's about loving where you live. And if you love what, where you live, you're going to protect it and care for it. And you can start by calling that where you happen to have your home, um, thinking about to your neighborhood block, thinking out to your community, to your city, to your, you know, to ultimately we get to the family of the planet, which we're all part of. And until we can think about that we're all interrelated, we're all interconnected, the global economy makes that more evident every day, um, until we live and realize that in a, in a realized way, um, too many people will be suffering. And so, at heart, I guess our sustainability mission, or, or the, that I take to heart, is uh, alleviating suffering, making it less bad, because that's what we can do right now, with the hopes that the quantum leaps that President Gorbachev made happen, taking down the Berlin Wall, creating that massive value shift so that we just wouldn't even consider some of the practices that we uh, are currently practicing, um, you know, will become the, the mainstream way of, of how we live. Definitely. Wise words. Thank you. Uh, that is really my guest today. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. It is always a pleasure Thank to chat much. with folks who are so in the work every day and trying to make a difference in the space of sustainability. Um, well, thanks to you and to your viewers absolutely. who are also on the path of making a more sustainable world. It's been great to spend some time with you. Definitely. Uh, all right, everyone, make sure you check out globalgreen.org. I'm Shane Snipes, part of sustainable1000.com. Talk to you real soon, and have a great sustainable day.